and what's going on and what we're going to do. Right, so, um, okay, my screen is completely back. So, um, this week I'm presenting Games for Health. Um, now, I put up on front of it some possible topics. Did you guys see those possible topics? No, okay, I'll have to raise attention to it. Um, we have some choices to make about content. Um, and I want you guys to start looking at leading some of the discussions on papers. So, one way to do that is to look at what topics within serious games we want to cover. Um, there are, as we said, there's health and education are our, like, the, the big areas, and so we thought we'd start with Bruno and, and, and I talking about a, a bit of games for education. Um, and, the machine done? Okay. Um, Bruno and I talking about, uh, a bit about games for education and games for health. And then we'd start getting you guys to select the topics that were interesting to you in terms of what you want to learn more about, right? Because a bunch of stuff we're doing here is, um, okay, I'll show you this tool as well. Um, a bunch of stuff we're doing here, it doesn't really, so long as you're learning something in the serious games things, you can be talking about serious games. Um, and so, one of the areas that, um, I'm going to duplicate this so I can see what's behind me. Um, go here and, so one of the things we need to discuss is what topics you want to cover. Uh, so, duplicate and apply. So, So if we had a look, there was up here what I intended to be, uh, which I didn't raise anything to do, is proposed topics. Okay, so proposed topics. Um, this is the idea that there are a lot of topics in here. Um, <coughs> oh, Marcus done. Game technology. Um, well done, Marcus. You're the only student there behind the link. Um, that's because I didn't force the others to go and look. Okay, so um, here are some proposed topics. We have... Game taxonomies. Now, um, one of the things we're going to talk about, and when we look at the Games for Health stuff, is how you break down a, a large collection of things into a hierarchy, a way of making sense of them. Uh, and so game taxonomies are a discussion around how you do that breakdown. Um, I want to discuss that at least, but if, if someone's particularly interested in how those breakdowns work and how to write them, um, then that would be a good one for a student to focus on. Now, one of the things that I also do with this is uh, in the oral exam, um, I ask general questions, but this is this becomes your specialist topic. Right? So I'll ask you more in-depth questions about your specialist area. Uh, and so I want you guys to read more in your specialist area, right? And be be able to comment more about that area, right? So um, we have game technology, uh, games for science, scientific discovery, games for rehabilitation, propaganda games, um, games and politics, games and diet, game metrics and analysis, games for the elderly, game technology. Um, there are a large number of games, uh, like serious games now, um, and if you have an interest, then you can probably find games that are being made in some serious way around that interest, right? So um, even gamification of sports media, for example, right? Um, or you could look at things like... Um, Code, the Khan Academy as, to some extent, gamifying some of maths and, and um, some of those code, the, uh, code um, coding websites where you try and learn coding, they start at they have levels and they've got um, experience and they give you points and, and they're trying to add game elements. Um, so one of the things I'm interested in is actually having you guys um, look into an area specifically. Are there areas that you are sp particularly interested in in serious games? I combination of something outside of 
entertainment with game. Like mind games, you have to like think three, three, four moves ahead. Okay, because um, so game, there's there's a whole section of games for mental training, right? And puzzle games are often considered sort of mental training exercise, right? Uh, one of the the analogies I use is like when, and um, it may be offensive, but um, when you see a, like a big fat guy running down the road in jogging suit and kind of you know the headband on and you know. Uh, a lot of people are like, yeah, he's, he's out there, he's trying to lose weight, right? You kind of get that positive, he's obviously doing something to try and, and, and affect his, his fitness. Um, but when you then walk past uh, a person sitting at a table doing a complex a crossword puzzle, you don't think, wow, they're doing really good, they're trying to make their brain fitter. Right? You, don't, you don't have that instant, oh, they're working hard and improving themselves. I mean, you see the when they go back to me, oh, look, it's a nerd. <laughs> yes, <laughs> look, it's a nerd. Not, hey, wow, he's doing great exercises to try and make his brain fit, right? So um, I think you get you get those, that kind of, of what is, yeah, that, that perception. And so the serious games for mental training. Um, I mean, one of the, the uh, research, uh, some of the research papers, and they've done, done re reconfirmed this result, it's very, it's a very bizarre result. Um, okay, so strength training on your hand grip, grip strength. Okay, you guys have seen those wee, the wee um, grip strength. Seen it. <laughs> yep. With where you have a bar here and a bar here and a spring, and you press and you try and make your grip stronger. Right. Okay? Um, some people do this for for climbing. Right. It's an exercise you can do to get your finger strength. Oh no, I, I forgot the other physiology, physiology uh, it's claimed that it may not be very productive in terms of being better at climbing, because it's yeah. more complex than just being strong in your... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just strength, there's actually a whole bunch of biomechanical things going on. Um, sometimes, p like, there, there's pianists kind of who do it to try and flex the muscles so that they're, they can play for longer and endur endurance and stuff. Right. What they found is that, so they did an experiment to see how much of it is actual physical strength growth? growth. Now, um, they did three conditions, and this is so science, so we'd have control groups, and we have experimental groups. In this case, they did a three-way experiment um, where they had a control group who sat and read a newspaper, right? and they had a group who used the strength increasing spring, and then they had a group in the middle which sat for the 20 minutes and thought really hard about what it was like to use the spring mechanism. They didn't do it. They just did, sat there thinking about it. The group in the middle got half the strength increase of the people who actually did the exercise. Just by thinking about doing the exercise. And that's what sports visualization is all about. And that's what sports visualization, there's a lot of about actually making the brain more effective because um, you guys know the, the story. The system pulling out the control the muscles. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you guys know the, the stories of like mothers who see their car, their kid cat, crept down the car and go up and lift up the side of the car and the kid gets out and then, you know, they try and do it two days later and they, there's no movement at all, right? It's just, now, and, and you can, if you pump people full of adrenaline, they're actually like, you know, crazy, uh, I think some of the, the, the ultimate fighting things where they, they remove the restriction on having drug use. You can actually pump people full of enough adrenaline that their muscles will shatter their bones. Right? So some of these big fighting guys who have been doing training, their muscles are so strong that if you pump them with enough neurosignal, the muscle will compact and break the bone. Um, so you actually have, your muscles are a lot stronger than you perhaps have access to. And if you pump in adrenaline, you increase the amount of neurosignal going to the muscle fibers, which increases their contraction. Now, by doing the mental training, one of the things you're doing is increasing the amount of neurotransmitter, the amount of, of signal you're sending to your muscles. So your muscle physiology doesn't get 
doesn't change for us. But your ability to send the right signal to it, to get it to do what you want, changes. Right? And so, um, yeah, and as you're saying with climbing, it's, it's not just the physical size of your muscle that matters much, right? It's actually your ability to utilize the muscle that you have. Um, and in fact, what they found was... Um, the sequencing of muscle firing, because there are lots of muscles that need to move in a certain order to get yep. the mo move you want, so... Yeah, and, and what they found is, uh, you know, like the, the um, uh, RSI, um, the overuse syndrome, you know, typing too much. You guys ever worried about getting, mm -hmm. getting RSI? Re repeated strain injury or OOS, occupational overuse syndrome? You've heard of it, yes? Yeah, it's, um, they had like a uh, documentary and stuff where the teacher got what they call the mouse disease because they used the uh, mouse too much, so they got like stiff hands. Yep. One of the interesting things that's going on there, and they, they, that when they do the fMRI, um, you find that it's partly to do with the neuro signals to the, the, the muscles, right? Um, in your brain, you, okay, do you, how much brain physiology do you guys know? <laughs> Almost none. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you've got someone who's going to do the neuroscience PhD as your lecturer, so I like neuroscience. Um, okay, the brain is so some kind of brain with lower brain stem here. And yeah. Um, across the center, across here, you have your um, motor cortex, and it maps. There are neurons here which fire to make so this, this up. Is in, this um, is seen from from the, the eyes are like this is side view. Is, uh, is, 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 is this a side view? Okay. This, this, this is, is front, front view, view yeah. right? So this is a this is a cut through mm. there. Okay. So this is me looking at you with a cut that way. And that's side view with eyes out, looking out that way. Right? Close enough to brain, do you see what I mean? This area here, so the area across the top here, is your motor cortex. This side controls this, part, this side of the body, and this side controls this side of the body. Weird wiring, but you know, uh, somehow nature ended up doing crossovers. Um, now, there are neurons here for for the mouth and the lips and the hands and each and there are neurons for each finger and each muscle in, in the fingers. You can actually find individual neurons here. Collections of neurons which if you stimulate with a electrical pulse will fire. One of the things they found with carpal tunnel was that the mapping of individual um, neurons started to 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 merge. So the users, so so the person was unable to differentiate the muscle use between this finger and this finger because they're typing and they correlate so often or gripping the mouse. You are always firing this, the neuron that holds that with the neuron that holds that, and basically they, they wire together whenever you get those two happening. And the problem is caused by the muscles all firing together. And so with climbing, for example, it's not the muscle strengths you have, but that you're using them correctly and in the right sequence. Because if you just grip really hard, you can wear yourself out by having all the muscles tense all the time when they don't need to be. Right? And so you find, you're trying to find ways where you're managing that, that connection. And so psychological training games. Right? So there's a whole category of, of brain training games. Um, I, you'd look up the stuff on Illuminate. Um, guys, any of you have an Illuminate account? They have quite a few. Um, <clears throat> and so we can look at Illuminate. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, Lumosity. Lu oh, sorry, not Illuminate. Lumosity. Lumosity. Sorry. Illuminate, Lumosity. It's, it's, it's lighting stuff up. <laughs> okay, so Lumosity is this side here. Um, cutting edge neuroscience personalized view. Um, yeah, so it's brain training, um, and 
<clears throat> it actually uses basically a bunch of standard psychological tests and turns those into games and then trains you on those so you get better at psychology tests. We will discuss this as, as whether this is a good thing or not. So luminosity, so that's, that's an area that you could cover. Right? So, this, this, so, this, so I want all of you to find areas that you're interested in. Uh, and by Thursday, we will allocate what will be happening next week. Okay? So this week is going to be games for health, so it's going to be me. And then from next week on, I want you guys to be leading some of the discussion and choosing specialist topics for yourself to be more interested in. Now, it would be useful, as we said, for these to be aligned perhaps with the project that you want to do. Right? Because you're going to have an integrated project. So if, if you're interested in doing a game-related integrated project, find a topic that is something in that area and do your kind of specialised topic in that area. Right? Um, Maybe you could add a comment here, because uh, what we know from uh, previous students here is that when you come here in the fall, you're all going to be very frustrated because you are going to be in control of everything. You need to come up with topics for everything. So do this exercise now with the purpose of getting used to, oh, the world is out there, I need to pick something that interests me, and with supervisors, I'm going to scale it down so I choose something that is uh, doable within the time frame. And uh, you, it, it may feel bad that uh, we force you to choose, but in, in a year or so, you're going to be quickly to become a project manager, and people are going to come to you to tell them what to do, and you can go many places to ask. So it's about time that you do get into to that uh, that mode, and it's uh, it's tough. Uh, in all courses, you need to choose everything. It, it's kind of tough. So get used to it now and, and choose the right way. Okay. So, yes. Um, get used to it. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, there's the... Um, Yes, there's a, there's, there's, there's a phrase in, in, um, in New Zealand that occasionally gets, gets used, which is a bit mean um, on the whole getting used to it thing, um, which is um, take a cement pill and harden up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, um, sometimes you just have to, to take the medicine and harden up and just do the job. Um, sometimes it's not pleasant, but you know, it just has to be done. So, um, But no, you guys will have to make choices. One of the things we like about choices, it means that you guys can can go out and find the papers you want to review, right? Now, this is the start of you guys becoming master students. With your master's course, we expect you to find papers, read them, review them. Um, and you kind of do that yourself. In this course, you can say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this topic, and there's a good paper, or Simon, I'm interested in that topic, you find a good paper, and we review it together so that you get used to the idea of reviewing papers and how to do it. Okay? We just are doing that in this particular field of serious games. Okay, um, I also wanted to add some stuff that I didn't talk about in terms of games and how to categorize them. Um, now, we do this in our first year class, and some of you have done my first year class. One of you has done my first year class. I don't think I've seen any of the rest of you in my first year class because hmm? game design. Yeah. Do you remember way back game design? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we talk about in game design is um, we use uh, the game design book by um, Jesse Shell, uh, and we use the he uses the elemental tetrad. He calls it just to give it a sort of scientific -y name. But it's, again, four. You know how we keep talking about four being an interesting number? Yeah, um, it's four things that games, that you can design around, that you can talk about with the design of a game. And so what they are is the aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic. The story. The mechanics and the technology. Okay, so these four are different.
parts, when you look at a game, you can sort of look at it as, as having components in all of these. Okay? Now, um, the difference between a game and a movie or other, in, or other kind of interactive stuff is usually this area here, the mechanics. No? So what are the mechanics of the game? Because without mechanics, if you just have aesthetics, which is how it looks, a story, which is a background narrative, and some technology, you know, The Hobbit right, is a movie. It uses cool 3D red cameras and stuff, right? So it uses cool visualization technology, 48 frames a second rather than 24. So it's, it's got a bunch of technology, it has a story, and it has an aesthetic look and feel. It's not a game. But it has three of these four. Games, to make something a game, it basically has to have this, and without that, it's not going to be, we're not going to call it a game. However, it's, if you just take out the mechanics of the game, you, are lo you can lose a lot of the experience of the player. Okay? Uh, and so when we look at, at papers in this area, one of the things we can do is we can talk about the aesthetics, the story, the technology, and the mechanics of the game. Uh, and in here, we'll be looking at actually sort of some of the gameplay elements. And last, um, in the first lecture, where I talked about, and on the slide, where I talked about having agency and experimentation and, um, and socialization and feedback, most of those were talking about game mechanics and how those mechanics support player experiences. Um, the aesthetic story and the technology, if you don't have the, well, if you don't pay, pay attention to those, your game, although may have excellent interactive mechanics, it doesn't <coughs> look good, or there's no motivate, there's no story motivation for people who need a uh, a reason to be doing things. And if you pick the wrong technology, you may have a great game but just not be able to play it. Right? So uh, one of the challenges they had for um, first-person shooters when they first came out with people computers just weren't fast enough to display stuff. So they had to fight the technology to get it to a point where you could actually play the game the way it was intended, right? And have that the right experience. Okay, so when we look at these papers, uh, we're going to discuss we're going to discuss those four. Um, a couple of other things I want to, you guys to think about is when you're analyzing papers. There are, in science, there are a couple of things we talk about, and I talked about it before, is we have an experimental group and a control group. Now, if you're reading a, a scientific paper, you should try and identify, do they have an experimental group and a control group? Right? If they don't, then they might be doing some meta-analysis or they're doing a position paper, but it's usually not a very good scientific study unless you have an experimental group and a control group. Right? Just doing experiment on things with no control means you, you have no idea whether it's what you were doing that made the difference. Right? Now, <clears throat> the, we talked about a quasi-experiment and an experiment where in a, in a full... RCT, random control trial, is generally considered the gold standard for, for research be, and, and double blind. Right? Double blind. Okay. You guys know what double blind is? One, two, no. <laughs> He's not blinded in both eyes. Um, okay. There's two blind people. There's two blind people. <laughs> and there's two blind yeah. The blind leading the blind. The researcher doesn't know how to do the It's something you doesn't know how to do the research Right. It, yeah, it, 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 that's very close, right? So no, that, that's, that's good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so when, like say, Marish and I come up with a new pill to make you smarter, okay? 
and we decide, right, at the beginning of the, the semester, we're going to give all of our students this new pill that will make them all very, very intelligent. Right? Now, if we did bad a bad study, we would just give all of our students this new pill. And tell them. And <laughs> tell them that we've given you this new pill that will make you smarter. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> and then later ask you, do you feel smarter? And you go, yes, Simon. <laughs> and they go, excellent. That's fantastic. I'm really happy. Here's an A. Right? Um, and I see that all my students get A's and my pill now works and so I can sell it to the world. Okay? Um, that would be considered very dodgy <laughs> science. Right? I could do the same thing with a game, right? I could make you all go play a game and go, hey, I've made this awesome game that will make you smarter. You guys should all play it. And then you play it, and I say, Alfred, did you enjoy the game? You say, yes. Did it make you smarter? Yes. And then I said, uh, and because I know you've all played the game, and I could, maybe I can see who played the game. Think, yeah, they've tried really hard. And I give them all the way. So I've just proved my game makes you better at my course. Well, not really, right? Because there's several problems with that, with that approach to a study. One is, you guys know you're playing a game. Right? And you know you're playing a game that I designed to try and have an effect. So you know what's being tried to be achieved. Now, um, that can cloud your understanding of what you're doing and your connection. I know who's played the game, and I know that I made this game to try and make you smarter. So my natural instinct is, is to think, people who play the game are going to be smarter. Now, if we take this back to my initial pill idea, if Marish and I came up with this pill, if we were to do a proper, if we were to do a randomized control trial, what we'd do is we'd get the whole class, right? We wouldn't actually ask for volunteers, because we'll read that, that biases the result to people who are willing to take breaks. Um, but we'd take the whole class, and, we'd, and we would roll the dice, and we'd allocate them to control group A and control group B. All right, so you guys would all be randomly split into A's and B's. We would then take a set of pills and we'd make them completely identical, one with our drug in it and one with no drug in it, and we'd give those to Runa, and we'd say to Runa, okay, um, here are pill A and here are pill B. Give all the A's to the people in A, group A, give all the B's to the people in group B. We're not gonna tell you which one has the drug because Runa has to be blind to the content. And to make them identical, you as participants would need to be blind to the content. Right? So we as researchers don't influence you, right? Because if Runa knows which is the, the pill as good and which pill is bad, it's astounding, but you guys will read his body language when he gives you the pill. Right? He'd go around going, here's your pill, here's your pill, here's your pill, here's your pill, here's your pill. <laughs> and it's astounding that humans cannot stop that happening. Right? And they've done lots of tests, they've tried it. Humans aren't able to not have some visceral response. Knowledge. I actually seen a movie with that concept where they took prisoners who were on death row and take the death and then put them in a research group to make them have emotions to make them regret what they did. And the researcher was so convinced that the pill worked because one of his patients were like showing these good results, and at the end he found out that he was in the uh, uh, <laughs> the sugar pill control group. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, it happens, right? Yeah, and, and it's, it's it's astounding. It, and so this is so so random control trials and double blind is the gold standard for trialing things. The big problem we have in serious games is it's really hard for me to blind you to the fact that you're playing a game as a player. Okay, if. If you know that my goal is to motivate you to do something, right, which, you, you know, you're here in a class, you can probably work out that we want to teach you stuff, right? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, it's going to be hard to kind of 
remove that bit on. And if I asked you to play a game, I would have to get two kind of, one game that was educational and one game that wasn't educational and try and convince you guys not to recognize the difference and not to talk to each other about the games that you were playing and then say, wait a minute, they're playing an awesome game that helps them learn stuff and I'm playing this stupid game that doesn't help me learn things. I think they're in the experimental group and I'm in the control group. Right? Because it would be obvious what was going on. I can't make them appear identical to you because they would have to be functionally different in terms of their game style for you to interact with them differently and therefore play them differently and therefore learn differently. So I can't blind the user. I can kind of blind me as to which group you're in, certainly when I'm testing you. Right? So that's why we, just, we would use kind of single blinds where I don't know as a researcher which group my data is coming from. Right? Well, I, I just have group A data and group B data. I don't run the experiment as to who, who is playing the game and who isn't playing the game. They just, I just get data back and do that analysis to prevent my analysis being blurred by the fact that I know I want group A to do well and I want group B to do badly because B is the control group. So I want, you know, even me wanting the difference, I can analyze things and try and move things and even unintentionally get it wrong. So, random control trials, double blind is the best. So, a a quasi-experiment is what we've, people now use to say when they have volunteers rather than random. So when you, when you lose this one, you go to a quasi-experiment rather than a full experiment. And that is where you, you allow individuals to choose whether or not they play the game. Right? So if I have a drug that makes you smarter, and I say, right, we're going to take the, like, everybody, you all have the option of taking the smart, the, the smart pill. Everyone who chooses, who says yes, can, can take the smart pill. Right? That would be a quasi-experiment. And again, that has a lot of problems in it. Because there might be a correlation between people who are willing to take a pill that will make them smarter and people who are willing to do work to make themselves smarter. And they, that could be correlated. People who don't want to pay, take a pill may do the, well, you know, it'd be nice to be smarter, but I'm not willing to take that risk. So maybe the correlation between willing to take the risk and willing to work hard and becoming smarter. So and instantly your choice of participating selects something about your participant. Okay, so if we have a look at these actual papers, we'll be able to kind of do some of this, what are these four elements, and what kind of experiment, and what size of experiment. Um, size is a big problem. You guys almost certainly will have that problem during your masters. How do you get enough people to participate in your activity to get large enough data? So what do you guys think would be a good sample size of people to do something? What's a good sample size? It depends. It depends. <laughs> if, I was, if I was trying to measure the height of people in this room to determine if um, women were shorter than men, would there be enough people in this room to do that? You don't think I'd have convincing results? Actually, I don't know what the results would be. I think, I think actually we've got relatively tall women in this class and relatively <laughs> short men. So I think we might end up with a, with a conclusion that women are taller than men on average, which might be incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> so this sample size is not enough. I know, you know, well, this, it depends on uh, how, how sure you will be about the results. Yeah, how, how representative your sample is and how... how certain you would be of your results. So, I mean, we've still got, what, six, I mean, nine... I mean, if you have 50% confidence, it's all right. Okay. So, so, we ha so you're, you're not happy that we've got enough people, even though we're kind of at sort of the, the 13... We're more than 10, right? We're between the 10 and 15 people. Right? So, 6 and 6 makes 13 with me. Um, 14, if we use Marcus, but it's hard to just measure... He, he would have to self-report his height, and, you know, he could say, oh, 
I'm six foot five. <laughs> and, you know, we, he's on the internet, so we wouldn't really know. Um, but And self-reporting is also a real challenge for experimentation, right? Because if I give you a game to play that I say is going to make you smarter, and then you tell me whether you felt smarter after using it, <laughs> yes, I felt, felt smarter. Okay. What have I learned? Well, you know, I've learned that my game makes you feel smarter. Does it make you actually smarter? Uh, potentially completely independent of you feeling smarter. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to look at, at, at these kind of, of sample sizes as well. So, yeah, even 13, you're feeling that that wouldn't be a large enough sample to measure height accurately. Okay? And, you know, on, on average, women's height is quite a lot shorter than men. And quite larger difference than most of the educational differences we're trying to measure here. So you would think we'd need much larger studies. And that's one of the things we're going to look at for these three papers is that, you know, their study sizes, one of them's good, the other two, uh, not so much. Um, and so, and we're going to look at that with what kind of trials they use. Um, and we can discuss the questions that you guys bring up about the, the papers. Okay.